On to the January edition of the ESACS Talks, our monthly youth-led conversations about cultural heritage. Today we'll be discussing museums and art and their role in portraying cultural heritage. My name is Riley Marshall and I'm part of the ESAC Coordination Committee that has put together this event and I will be moderating it here tonight. A few housekeeping notes, we will be recording this video to publish later on YouTube, so if you wish to remain anonymous, we kindly ask you to keep your video off during the event. Um, and for a few housekeeping, or, <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to Carlota Marwan, our Vice President, for a few announcements. Hello, um, and welcome everybody. Um, um, the first uh, announcement that we have is that we are looking for people to join our coordination committee. We would like someone to help organize this event, uh, the ESAC the talks, and also for our publication and in the administration team. So I will be sharing the link uh, um, soon afterwards in the chat so you can have a look and everyone is welcome to join. Uh, it's just a simple application to send your CV and a motivation letter. So it would be great to, to count with as many of you as possible. And another thing is that we have we already have released the call for abstracts for next month, which will be on sustainable tourism. And we will be partnering with Our World Heritage, which is a citizen movement that was launched last year to create um, kind of maybe more intense ESSEC talks than usually, which I think will be really fruitful. And we're super grateful to have a really amazing partner for next month. Um, that's it for me. I will, again, I will share the screen, um, the links on the chat, and I hope that, you know, see you soon. All right, thank you. And so tonight we will hear from five wonderful speakers about their experiences in museums and art. And today we will hold all questions for the end for a brief Q&A session after each of the speakers have presented. Um, feel free to use the chat to write any questions that you have um, as you think of them, but please also remember to include the name of the speaker that you're addressing so we can remember that for the question and answer session at the end. Um, today, keep an eye on the chat throughout the event because we will be sharing links and information about the speakers and their topics, as Carlo mentioned. And finally, as you've seen on, I'm sure you've seen on our social media platforms, at the conclusion of the program tonight, we will be having breakout sessions. For those of you interested in continuing the conversation, um, we will divide into smaller groups and we have some discussion plus some discussion questions planned for you. Um, and it's easy to join, just stay on the call at the end of the meeting um, and we will break you out from there and provide further details at the time. Um, and now it's time to hear from our speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Charlotte Rixton. Charlotte is the director of the Museum Villa Mondrian on the Dutch-German border. Villa Mondrian is where Piet Mondrian grew up and got his start at becoming one of the masters in Dutch painting. Um, it's dedicated today to displaying young talent and contemporary art. And with her appointment in 2019, Charlotte became the youngest museum director of the Netherlands at age 25. She sees cultural heritage as the story we tell about ourselves and aims not only to tell the story, but to make sure everyone can understand and be a part of it. Charlotte, we're delighted to have you here with us tonight and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Riley. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what I would like to talk to you guys today. Also very fun, I see Shaila has joined us. She's one of our junior directors, also from Fila Mondrian. So in case you have more questions about the museum, you can also ask Shaila. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've basically just prepared a short talk. Uh, Karota asked me if I could tell a bit more about, you know, how my career so far in the arts has been. And I decided seeing to keep it short to five minutes to kind of link it to three like overarching statements, um, yeah, principles that I've adhered to so far uh, that I really think have really helped me at any point in my career. So I would like to keep to that. And for that, I will share my screen. There we go. So I hope you can all see that properly. And the one thing I've noticed, like I've been asked, this question a bit more often now like well you know how has your career been do you perhaps have any advice uh what it's been and the most annoying thing I found that a lot of those really basic cliche blogs that you have about careers um you know where they give all the same cliche tips a lot of them are actually kind of right <laughs> when I look back 
on my own career and I'm trying to like summarize it in like some 10 top tips how to sort it. Um, so this is kind of a play on that in that they are the very key phrases, but I think you could also interpret them a bit different. And with that, those are three. And the first one is actually check your privilege. So check your privilege, I mean, like normally we see that really from a more societal standpoint. Um, but personally, I've mainly also used it in a very selfish way to say what privileges you have yourself. And the main thing that I've done is always seen where there was opportunities. And that's not like in some very career minded, oh, this is a business opportunity way. Um, but the thing I did was really look around, especially in university, what options there are. And I, I really, I think university is the absolute best place for that. So I did two bachelor's degrees next to each other, but that kind of started with just one of my mentors in like one of the very first weeks of uni. So I'm like, well, you could just sign up for any class you like. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. Just sign up if you fit the entry requirements like nobody's gonna tell you not to come um so with that is actually how I even started in the arts so I was studying international relations um completely different thing and that was just this really interesting film studies course that I was like well I could just sign up and they can't tell me no <laughs> so I signed up found out that Besides just going to museums, I really loved learning about art as well, uh, and then signed up for an art history degree. And basically that just expanded and expanded. Um, so for me, Check Your Privilege um, really has been focusing on all the different things you can do. And oh, I can't seem to click, there we go. But within that, when I had all these different opportunities, because one of the things I also did with that uh, was did a lot of different internships, actually also at Fila Mondrian. So we have a system with the junior directors, which I was one. But basically you do a six month internship, but you are already in charge of the daily management of the museum. And my internship here with Fila Mondrian, so that was about two years before I came back as a director. Um, I That was the last internship that I did. Uh, and it really, for me, fit into a longer plan. So going back to check your privilege, like all the opportunities you have and finding out in that, um, to me, it really was a way to explore different ways, uh, explore different things in art, and basically within that find my overarching statement in a sense so this is the part where normally you get into the part of like oh we'll have an elevator pitch you know have that one sentence that fits on the top of your cv and you know i always thought that was ridiculous like this is very weird american idea that you know even just the term elevator pitch that somehow you will stand in the elevator with your boss you would not even be in most contexts and you just tell them this amazing thing in three sentences and all of a sudden like oh my god you're amazing you're the new vice president and you get to do it um but I have found that secretly I had kind of an elevator pitch um and that's actually the one thing Riley also said about me is that the one thing I'm interested in is cultural heritage as the story we tell ourselves about ourselves and I've meandered quite a bit. I mean, even just the whole art <laughs> basically is a bit of a meander of the path I had set out. Um, but that has been the sentence in the back of my mind since the beginning. And the thing I ended up in before I came to Fila Mondrian, um, I was really working into digitization and online collections. And when I started, with art, that wasn't that big a thing yet. I mean, of course it was there, but it wasn't like any part of our curriculum yet. Um, you know, it wasn't there, but 
it was something in the end that I was kind of working towards because I had that one sentence like cultural heritage is a story we tell ourselves about ourselves so when it did came across my path I already realized I'm like you know this fits into that narrative fits in what I've been doing and having had that motto basically um, it made sure that all the different projects and internships everything I did always worked towards one storyline and there always was an overarching goal so also when it came to all the things I did even though it was very diverse um, you know I did a million things because that was my outlook in everything um, I could place everything in that bigger narrative and I also had a lot of purpose to all the projects and internships that I did because uh, I knew exactly what they could help me achieve and how they would fit in with everything else I've done before that. Um, so when I said earlier from my like, goal, oh, you know, with Fila Mumrian as a junior director internship, that was the last one I did. All my other ones before that build up to it. So I started uh, first, I started in Groningen and there is a few museums the Baltiplatz in Ilde. Uh, and the first internship I did was there as an assistant curator. And that was actually the easiest job interview I've ever had because I was the only applicant. <laughs> uh, and that's because in Groningen, those you have the Groningen Museum. I don't know if you know the Netherlands, but it's one of the big museums. And everybody wants to do their internship there so they can then move on and work there. And it's a great museum. It's a great place to do an internship. But I already had a bigger purpose. I knew exactly what I wanted to do in an internship. And they didn't have one that fit what I wanted. At the same time, there was the both Blads. Uh, they were just starting up with an internship program. And I really saw them like, oh, they're just starting with this. They're a small team. There is enough space for me there to create the internship that I would like to have. And because I knew very, you know, very exact what I wanted out of that internship, I not only was a good opportunity, but also because through board year and stuff that I've done already in university, uh, I already knew the people. So again, check your privilege. <laughs> um, and I knew that they'd be a good team to work with. So live with purpose in that sense of me is going to like, don't approach it as an elevator pitch, but, you know, have an end goal. Um, for me, it really been from like, you know, make sure that all the puzzle pieces that I collected uh, would finally fit into an image. Like I didn't have the box. I didn't realize what the image was I was working towards, but I knew like at least all the puzzle pieces would fit together. And with that, another thing I found and I still find very helpful, um, I kind of kept it like after this one in more like the bullet journal vibe. So please just imagine this and like some fancy lettering script with some stickers and stuff around it. A um, bit of self-care, check in with yourself. Because um, I think the last thing, and I think I'm already a bit over time, so I'll hurry it up. Uh, that was really important for me is to always have a plan B. And I think especially in the arts, like it is not an easy field to work in. It's also not a very kind field in a lot of places. Like, you know, I think we're one of the only fields where it's expected almost that you have about two years of unpaid experience uh, before you get an entry level role. And, you know, the applicants to... Uh, open positions ratio is just absolutely atrocious for us. Uh, so to check in with myself and always have a plan B that was something completely different. Um, for me, that really helped also just putting into perspective what I really wanted out of working in the cultural sector. Uh, so I said earlier, like first I was more leaning towards digitization. Um, I've also worked with diplomacy and all kinds of different fields to also get a view of the options that are out there, uh, but also to really help decide what it is that I really like about working in the cultural sector, because there's a lot of places and a lot of ways you can work 
private sector, not in a cultural job at all, uh, but still be very much related to it and still do very much with it. You know, so what is it that basically makes you accept these conditions in a lot of cases? Uh, but also, what are you looking to gain out of this? And I think having a completely different plan B, um, it can help you develop skills you didn't know you had that could help, for instance, when it comes to the digital side. Um, just to have something completely different, I at one point started with web development and coding, not thinking I'd like it for longer than just the course, like because it's such a standard thing. Um, but I actually really loved it and I stuck to it and that really helped me transition into being from like, oh, well, maybe I really do want to work in online collections, but also in a completely different way than just talking about these objects, but actually getting them online and seeing the different ways you can manipulate them and play with them. Um, so it helped me actually have a more formed opinion about a cultural career. But on the other hand, it's also like an escape route. <laughs> So you know you're not forcing yourself into this one direction. And even if, you know, I eventually, I stayed, I absolutely love it. Um, but it gives you a completely different perspective on the type of jobs and what you'd like to do and, you know, what you actually can do with it and what you're willing to do with it. Because sometimes it can be absolutely brutal trying to get a job. and you know, going into those interviews with a completely different mindset. I'm like, well, you know, if it doesn't fit me, I'll have something else that fits me too. Um, really helped me to do those conversations better. Um, but also knowing what would be the best fit for me. Um, which turned out to be Fila Mondrian so far. <laughs> so I think I'm way over time past my five minutes. So I think I'll just give it back to you, Riley. <laughs> All right, wonderful, Charlotte. Thank you for sharing your experience. I think that brought up a lot of really good points for all of us to reflect on a little bit. Um, and to move on to our talk speakers of the night, the first speaker will be Giovanni Pescarmona. He is a historian and currently a PhD candidate at the University of Florence and his research interest focus on innovative digital technologies for the enhancement of cultural heritage. He is an advisor to Italian and foreign museums for the creation of digital products and experiences. Tonight he will present where the Renaissance meets technology. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> so please, please give me a sign if you can see my presentation slide. You can. Okay, so I'll just start now. And uh, thank you very much for hosting me. It's very nice to see you all again. And uh, my presentation is Where Renaissance Meets Technology. And for a second, I would like to, to imagine to be able to visit the museums of the world without moving from your country. And maybe imagine traveling through space and time, uncovering the secrets of the arts from the Renaissance. So this is now possible thanks to Bandini Icon and maybe just a pinch of your curiosity and imagination. So Bandini Icon is an AR app. Using the app, you can engage with the paintings in the Bandini Museum in an interactive way. The Bandini Museum in Fiesole, on the hills, it's near Florence in Tuscany, displays a collection of late medieval and early Renaissance panel paintings that you can see in this picture, mostly painted with gold and tempera on wooden panel. It's a small museum, we're talking of less than 100 works. So the app stems from a research of the University of Florence, and I was part of this research as a master's student. So we developed the app alongside Marcello Massida, who is an app developer who carried out the coding of the app. And this is in a way a form of innovative publishing of research results. 
So the app is free with no advertisements, no registration required. So there's no annoying uh, advertisements. And it's both available for Android and iOS, both in Italian and English. You just need a personal device like a smartphone or a tablet. The bigger the screen, the better the experience. And to demonstrate how the app works, we will explore an important painting, the Crucifixion by Lorenzo Monaco, which was painted around 1420. But the app works with many other paintings of the gallery, of course. So framing this painting with the device camera, the artwork is recognized by the software and the AR experience unfolds. In this slide, you can see an actual screenshot of the app while it's working in the museum. So two side elements are displayed on either side of the crucifixion in the middle. This work, in fact, was in the past a triptych. That is an altarpiece made by three distinct wooden panels. So most of the paintings in the Bandini Museum and most of the paintings in medieval and Renaissance art museums are in fact just fragments of bigger paintings composed of multiple parts. These are called polyptics. And these parts are now separated, are scattered in faraway museums. For instance, the panel on the left, the stigmatization of St. Francis is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And the panel on the right with the death of St. Francis is in a private collection in Rome. So we have travel through space, bringing together very distant artworks, but we also have traveled through time, recovering the original artwork as it was in the early 1400s. So the app was launched on the 29th of February, 2020, and uh, soon after the museum has been closed because of the coronavirus emergency. So we had to devise, and it remained closed for the majority of 2020. So we had to devise a strategy to keep the app alive and let the artworks speak. So the good news is that AR works not only with the original, but also with reproductions. And so we printed and distributed this playable cards, but also we published on social media accounts, high resolution images to be used by the people at home from the safety of their sofas so that people could engage with the museum using the app. So even if briefly, I hope that I have succeeded you in showing you uh, some of the innovative approaches that we can experiment in art museum using AR, which is an ever growing technology. But I have been very lucky because me and Marcello managed to find public funding for developing our ideas very quickly. And we found a fertile ground in the Museum of Fiesole, which was very open towards young innovators. And so I would like to hear your thoughts about some of ideas, some problems that we have. The first is how can art museums play the role of innovation hubs, tech hubs within societies in Europe? The second is if these tech oriented projects can connect museums in a network. And finally, will it be possible in the future to shape new forms of EU funding that can be easy to access, quick and scalable for startups? Thank you very much. I would love to hear your comments about this and I hope to see you soon in the near future in the Bandini Museum trying the app. All right, thank you, Giovanni. And that brings up a good point. All of our speakers today have been tasked with leading the audience um, with a few questions to think about. We will address some of those in the breakout sessions after the talk, but they will also be posted on social media in the days to come. So please follow up with your thoughts um, and opinions. Thank you. And our next speaker is Gabriele Lengosco. He is an art historian with a strong passion for Renaissance sculpture. He studied art history at the University of Genoa and was a research fellow at the Fondazione Roberto Longhi in Florence. He is currently working as a consultant writing museum labels and rethinking ways in which cultural institutions can communicate with their visitors. Tonight, he will present writing museum wall text and labels theoretical approaches and practical challenges. The floor is yours.
Thank you, Riley, for your presentation. I will try to share my screen. Um, let me know if you can see it. Uh, might be the sign. Or... OK, perfect. So I will start this presentation by showing a short uh, video. Um, in uh, April uh, 2020, uh, when cultural institutions were uh, closed, a creator and an artist uh, decided to find a temporary solution for this uh, situation. Uh, so they created a space uh, that could have been visited at least by their gerbils. In my opinion, this is an intelligent experiment uh, that may lead us to think, what are the elements that define a museum? Here we can see a space with uh, visitors, uh, with artworks and uh, close to the artworks, their relative uh, labels. And so labels are this important element that are written uh, to provide information to a uh, visitor. To write a labels, um, writing a labels is a complex uh, task that requires the awareness of some theoretical strategies. So firstly, to write a good label, one should keep uh, the visitor in mind. Labels are in fact um, randomly read. Some people just read the first couple of lines, some others the last line of the text. And often they are read aloud in group of visitors, so they should uh, be written to make a uh, conversation spark among uh, a visitor. Secondly, they have to place the object in their cultural context thus helping uh, the, the visitor to have a framework in which uh, seeing the, the object. And thirdly, labels should uh, make content accessible uh, to people that could have no background knowledge. Um, and so uh, they shouldn't describe what we are seeing, but explain the meaning or the interpretation of the things that are displayed. And thirdly, and finally, they should be engaging, so uh, otherwise people won't uh, read uh, them. I'm an art historian, which is currently working in the Galleria Nazionale di Palazzo Spinola, which is a small museum in uh, the city of Genoa in uh, northern uh, Italy. Uh, my job uh, consists in writing uh, museum labels for uh, them. In theory, labels are usually written by teams of uh, people that include curators, um, designers, uh, communication experts, and so on. Uh, but in uh, little museums, usually this is a task that is done alone in collaboration, maybe with the director, and that is my uh, case. And to show you my work, I'm, um, I will show you an example. I choose this uh, work of art preserved in the museum, which is an extraordinary um, Baroque uh, frame. Uh, and it's a quite a complex object. And so I will show how I try to uh, translate it into a short text. So first, keeping the visitor in mind, I decided to start with a short phrase that can give a bit of background. So during the Baroque period, simple objects acquired new functions and developed mechanisms to engage the observers. Uh, then I went on placing the object and its author in the cultural context that I've mentioned in the introduction. So driven by this idea, the Genoese sculpture Filippo Parodi transformed this frame into a mythological scene that communicates with the frame it painting, the portrait of a lady by the Flemish painter Fernand Poet. Then I explain the iconography, or in other words, what the frame represents. So the Greek goddesses Ira and Athena are represented at the side of the portrait while they are waiting for the result of a beauty contest. Higher to the left, the Aeral Hermes appears. He's supposed to award the prize a golden apple. Paris, a young shepherd appointed by the gods to be the judge of the competition, points at the winner, the lady portrayed. At the end, I put something that I believe can be engaging. So according to a popular theory, the frame originally contained a mirror. Thus, every observer could have become, looking at themselves in the mirror, the temporary protagonist of the myth. This is the final result. 
with at the top the title, date, the author, at the center, the description, and at the bottom, the um, catalog number. And I hope that by reading these, visitors can be drawn into the object. My aim is, in fact, uh, provide them with instruction to think about what they are seeing, uh, to make their interpretation of it, and to remember it after the visit. So being this uh, work in progress, I will be really glad to hear your comments and discuss about it uh, with you. And I have two questions for you. So first, what do you expect to find in a museum label? And uh, secondly, how can we contribute to improving and innovating traditional tools such as museum labels? And I thank you very much for uh, your attention. All right, thank you, Gabriele. Our next speaker will be Raul Gomez Hernandez. He is a master student of cultural heritage management in Madrid. Currently, he is doing his internship at the collections engagement team with Europeana, working on tasks like content curation, event coordination, and community management. He has worked as an archeologist in the UK and is really interested in spreading cultural heritage information using new technologies and audience engagement. He will be presenting tonight his talk on promoting diversity and inclusion with digital collections. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Riley. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I'm going to start my screen. Moment, please. Yeah. Okay. Can can you see the presentation? Yeah. Perfect. In this presentation, I will explore how European Foundation is promoting diversity and inclusion, and how the European education community was involved with the reinventing Beethoven challenge. Europeana Foundation is defined as the European platform, but also the professional network for digital cultural heritage. It contains millions of assets from more than 4,000 cultural heritage institutions, managed by European staff, organized in teams like development, collection engagement, among others. As a network, it manages six communities as copyright, education, or research, with more than 3,000 members participating in events, projects, and tasks. One one of these is the cross teams, where the staff is working in an important topic. One of these is, the, is diversity and inclusion. It aims to showcase the richness and diversity of European cultural heritage and highlight the most invisible communities like LGTB, black communities, and people with a disability. Some of activities organized are editorial campaigns and educational activities. This is the case of Reinventing Beethoven. In 2020, we designed this, this educational challenge to, en to engage creativity for students in primary and secondary school, inspired by the life and work of Beethoven. Because this year, it was the 250th anniversary of his birth. The aims were to encourage students' creativity and to introduce the powerful music as a powerful tool in the classroom. The challenge started on the 26th of October and finished on the 26th December with three important dates where editorials were published. Around 22nd November, San Cecil Day, music, Musician Patron, 3rd of December, International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and 16th December, Anniversary of Beethoven. The topics proposed in the challenge were Beethoven's life and work, about his biography, resilience, about disabilities and mental health disorders, to be aware the students about disabilities, and the Ninth Symphony, around the, the values and the influence to French revolutions and the symbols of the European Union. One of these things that we do is to we create a landing page on European Pro, a digital brochure, and we wrote a blog in the Teaching with Europeana blog, containing the guidelines, submission rules, and open educational resources. 
Other things that we do to engage students were to create two blocks, a gallery and a history and a collection. In, in, in this point, the gallery was life and work of Beethoven, so images of life and of his life and musical resources. Beethoven told to Joy a more contextualized biography from history, literature, science, and psychology. Psychology. Genesis and the disabilities, sports, scientific, and artistic careers of Ludwig van Beethoven, Bisraeli, Mileva Maric, and Francisco de Goya. And the story and answer collection explained how Beethoven's life and work is related to the Euro European values. The student group submitted their creative artworks through social media and hashtag like Reinventing Beethoven and Beethoven 2 to 50. We collect 28 artworks, belong to 10 to 16 year old student groups from 11 countries. Some of the teachers submitted other works in and out the contest. The voting was public, collecting 12,000 votes via Padlet and with a jury composed by a member of the European Education Community, a European School Net member, and Euroclear representative. They choose a winner per category and five finalists. Some of the samples are this one. Happy birthday Beethoven, composed by a virtual exhibition in escape room to explore life and works of Beethoven, Beethoven 3D, an animated story to discover what happened if Beethoven were today in COVID times, and soon with Beethoven, a talk with the composer. Finally, we did a satisfaction survey in Google Forms where teachers wrote their opinions. With this survey, we knew we fulfilled the objectives and teachers suggest to do it more often. So this is my question for you. What does educational project need to be engaged with young people? Thank you for all your time and for giving the opportunity to, to do this presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Raul. And our final speaker of the night will be Levent. He studied archaeology and history in Turkey and later completed his master's degree in world heritage studies and cultural heritage in Germany and in Australia. For his thesis, he researched the issue of the return of illicitly trafficked cultural property, both to and from Turkey, regarding policy consistency and goodwill. He will present his talk on the role of museums in the fight against illicit trafficking. Levent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Riley. Can you all hear me? Yeah, hello everyone. Can you see the screen? Um, I'm very happy to be here once again with all of you and to talk about museums and their roles in general. And I sincerely thank ESAC for this opportunity and to you for being here tonight. Um, cultural properties have always been on the move from one location to another by various actors for different reasons. From extreme poverty to forced sales, to trade to gifts, the reasons of, uh, for trafficking vary from case to case, yet the main objective is often unfortunately to supply goods to the excessive demand of the market for financial gain or sometimes even gain prestige and attract more visitors. This demand for arts and antiques is not a new phenomenon, of course, in both licit and illicit forms. However, in today's intensive global art trade, distinguishing licit and illicit trafficking is quite challenging due to the ever-changing and complex dynamics of the market structure in which the, tra the traffic is predominantly from east to west. Museums have always been the major players of the market who are in constant demand of fine or luxurious objects to fascinate visitors, but more importantly, to attract funds that would finance new acquisitions besides educational roles. Accordingly, as the ICOM Code of Ethics clearly states that the museum must act in a way to ensure safe acquisitions and the accessioning of any object which is offered to or demanded from the museum itself. Yet we still see museums with foreign artifacts or even biofacts that have no clear provenance or records or even documentation. 
For example, approximately 80% of Etruscan or Roman antiquities have an illicit origin worldwide, or 31% uh, of the Apulian posts are undocumented, and only 5.5% were lawfully excavated, reported by UNESCO. Although the problem is very clear, by acquiring illicit trafficked cultural property, museums still fuel the, uh, fuel the market, as it is obvious in the recent cases of Benin Bronzes at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, an Etruscan artifact at the Toledo Museum, and a Fillinger mask at the San Luis Art Museum in the US. Yet at the same time, there are also positive steps taken by uh, museums such as detailed investigations currently conducted by France and Germany on provenance research, especially linked with the Nazi looted art or colonial times, as well as successful individual return cases such as Zeugma mosaics from a US museum to Turkey or Eurofonius crater from the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, to Italy. In line with the situation and increased awareness regarding the integrity of the cultural property, as well as human rights issues, developed countries too gradually support the source country claims by signing bilateral or multilateral agreements such as conventions, memorandum of understandings, or enacting national laws to govern import and export of cultural goods. Uh, therefore, we should always remember that this problem is not endemic to a region or to a country, as the Hague Convention uh, states, clearly states that every single damage to cultural property belonging to any people whatsoever means to damage uh, the, to the cultural heritage of all humankind, since each people makes its contribution to the culture of the world. Therefore, it is the responsibility and right of the museums to deny any kind of unlawful transaction which promotes criminal activities and causes lots of prestige as well as money of the cultural institutions. By doing so, museums can play a significant role in creating a demand for the illicit trafficking of cultural property as well as in the protection of our common heritage since it is also linked with the promotion of extremists or terrorist organizations such as occurred in the very recent case of Daesh. In the end, with the rising demand for fair trade or organic products, as well as the moral factors, a reasonable balance between markets and source countries must be created based on consistency and goodwill with no exception in the application of the, of the already established uh, global standards. Moreover, the unique nature of concerned market goods is at least equally significant to be considered since cultural properties are irreplaceable or in more popular words, unsustainable. So thank you for listening and I'm very uh, happy to see your future contributions. And here are my questions for you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Levin, and a big thank you to all of our speakers tonight. Certainly a lot of interesting information and a lot for all of us to think about over the next few days and, and next few months as we are getting our careers started or, or studying further. Um, and we will now have time for a short question and answer session for all of our speakers. You are welcome to leave your questions in the chat and I can read them aloud, or if you would like to raise your hand um, and ask the questions directly, that works too. So I will leave you all with a few moments to think about your questions. Uh, go ahead, Carlota. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering how can the individual museum visitors contribute to the fight against illicit trafficking? Like what can we do as everyday people and not museum directors? Oh yes, it is a shared responsibility as you can imagine because we are all responsible for our future generations and even uh, for today's societies that, are, uh, they are, that their cultures are, uh, are in danger. So this is a, a global uh, problem and uh, we do share responsibility. And uh, when I think that, uh, when, when I think about your question, it is actually a very personal thing to do, but maybe you can start 
uh, listing or you can start um, like maybe giving more um, concentration or, or, uh, of uh, your visit to um, maybe foreign artifacts or foreign biofacts of the museum that are on display, of course, because other than that, you cannot see the uh, warehouses of the museums. But uh, maybe you can just um, see the collection and then identify each object that looks um, that looks uh, not from that country or that that uh, that region, let's say. So you can just list of it and take a picture of it and then send to the uh, related authorities. Maybe you can also check the label, of course, because labels have uh, labels have. In, in, like sometimes enough information about the uh, provenance or sometimes have uh, enough information about the um, origin of the object or me, even sometimes the, like the uh, accusation process. So this is a very important information, but it is not possible to find every time, of course. Uh, but it is surprising uh, when I check the British Museum's website, there are like uh, detailed information about each uh, object uh, that are all either on display or that is either on display or not. But you can see the process of uh, acquiring the object uh, from uh, who, when and where. So this is a very like, um, for example, a good start for you to check the, uh, check the object that is on display or not. Thank you. Um, and I have a question actually for um, for Giovanni about um, using the technology in a what is more traditional um, a museum setting. I think of being more traditional and rigid. Was there any pushback into incorporating um, apps or technology development in that regard? Uh, sorry, really, I haven't understood. You said, uh, was that any? Ah, did you find pushback in trying to incorporate ah, more, um, I guess, technical advances in a museum setting? Okay, uh, as, I, as I told in my, in, my, in my presentation, I was very lucky because the museum's director was a, I would say, what I would call an illuminated uh, manuscript director, an enlightened uh, personnel. And uh, she's Silvia Borsotti. I would like to mention her name because I'm very, very grateful to her for supporting me and supporting my ideas throughout the project. And uh, when I came to the museum, I came just as a student, as a researcher. I became gradually passionate about the collection and the stories it had to tell. So I, I devised that there was this lack in communication. And I thought that technology was the easiest way to bridge this gap. And, uh, and so the, the, the idea, the, the people from the museum fell in love with the idea at first glance. So no, I, I was very lucky because there was no pushback and the augmented reality was the perfect technology for that museum because as you have seen from the slides that I've shown you, there's no protective mirrors on the, on the images. There are no boundaries. So people are free to interact with the paintings, framing them with their cameras. And, and this, so, so the experience unfolds very naturally without any types of uh, constraint from the environment. So there's no physical constraint either. Okay, great. And I think I see Yvink has a question. Go ahead. Sorry, just uh, struggling with my microphone and camera <laughs> just open. So I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for their very interesting presentations. Uh, actually, I would like to connect maybe Giovanni and Raul uh, Gomez Hernandez, uh, because what Giovanni was asking, uh, as far as I remember, uh, he had prepared those questions and one of them was very crucial, I think, uh, to maybe create a platform where museums can um, cooperate uh, and uh, they can come together to produce something. It can be digital, it can be physical, I don't know, but maybe Europeana can play a role in this because as far as I know, I mean, I'm a member of Europeana as well. 
So they are very, very active in uh, digitization of heritage and they're providing uh, those kind of uh, open platforms and uh, also like this uh, common shared knowledge uh, type of events. So I don't know, Raul, uh, if you want to also provide some insights, if Europeana can take a role. Uh, as, as, I, as I know from from Europeana, it's mostly, it's mostly uh, when when we work to do all these apps or all all this uh, or all these uh, applications or techno technologies advances uh, we do with projects. So maybe uh, in our Erasmus Plus uh, project or or maybe in one of our generic service. They, they, they could do because they have uh, some some uh, budget for for these things in hours for for people who would like to do it or mostly to collaborate uh, as a volunteer developing all, all these things or 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 maybe in innovation hubs that they, they could uh, collaborate with Europeana but uh, European is a really good place to get all this digital uh, information for building on the loading of all, all these apps. And we are doing things in, in, in the loading apps and, and, and other uh, things with artificial intelligence and machine learning and all the things. And, and we think that if in any project we have any opportunity, maybe we do. Okay, and we've had a question come in from Betul for Giovanni. Um, what are the feedback of children, primary school age, for example, using the app? Um, how does your museum use the educational department to include to incorporate um, and include children into consideration in the app? Betul, I would really like to, to, to know that myself, but I don't know because uh, in 2020, we didn't have a single visit from schools. And since we, we started the project on, on February this year, we hadn't uh, quite the time to organize uh, school-related activities. The, you know, the app is quite specific. Uh, it's not immediate for, for use. So uh, we advise the use of some operators, like some teachers uh, using maybe a mm, larger screen device, like an iPad, like a 10 inch iPad, so that like school children can engage with the painting with this kind of mediated approach. So the teacher is using the app for the children. We find that more appropriate. And uh, the, the museum doesn't have actually an education department. We're talking about a very, very small museum, as I said, a hundred works. The proprietor of the artworks is the church, while the museum is uh, like stored in some uh, um, edifice of the communal offices. So it's a very small museum. And um, basically there's one manager, the director and a conservator just uh, beneath her. So we, we do not have really a, an education department. I work for them as an advisor. I curate their digital strategy. So we are, we are basically relying on internal resources to gather data and organize uh, activities for the school. But I'm very looking forward to maybe answer your question over the course of 2021 when, uh, when we could organize um, visits with many people again in museums. We just reopened, by the way, today. Uh, the Uffizi Gallery here in Florence reopened just today, so we're starting to see the light again. Really, you are muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, that's exciting news to hear that you're you're starting to open back up. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Carlotta, did you have a question? Yes, I have a question for Charlotte because I found her presentation super inspiring. And I thought it was really fantastic how you spoke about the Plan B, which actually is about interdisciplinarity. It's about not only being restricted to one discipline, but but having other ideas. And I'm wondering now that you are working, how are you continuing this? Do you have a plan for continuing education, or how are you still keeping this approach of you know web development and international uh, relationships in as you are working? 
Yeah, so the good thing as a director is you get to decide on everything. Um, so in that sense, I am continuing. So one of the first projects we did was launch our new website. Um, that definitely has a lot more opportunities. Uh, also some still in development, for instance, that we want to create just a sandbox box page uh, for young developers and artists to get together to really present digital art in a completely new type of online exhibition space. Uh, the only downside also as a director is that you already have a million things you have to take care of. Um, so in that sense, this is the first time for me uh, when I talk about a plan B, I always had a very defined plan B as like a kind of like a mirror approach. Same for like, all right, well, this looks good, but this is also an option. And why do I like one more than the other? Um, and yeah, actually, director was a long term plan. So to now get a mirror for that, which I wasn't expecting to come up this soon, is a bit harder. But you are correct that in essence, it is very much about being interdisciplinary. I think with any type, it helps as a sort of feedback process, if only just that, um, to see different approaches to the same medium. And that's actually what I find very exciting about a lot of projects, for instance, also Europeana is doing. Um, I'm also a member and, you know, I see a lot coming by. Uh, is basically getting rid of those boundaries and you know, making sure that those discussions are not just where everyone presents their view, but you can really take away different parts in all senses. Um, yeah, so long term for me, of what, when it comes to studies, um, I, I think I'm very much at the danger of one of those people. I was supposed to start a PhD to be like, oh, I still want to start my PhD at some point and be saying that for the next 30 years while life happens. Um, but yeah, I think if in any form, staying in contact with universities um, it's just so good whatever you do with your career but you know there's so much happening always and especially uh, between all different disciplines so just to see the events and you know hopefully at one point being able to join again uh, that we have more physical events although actually it's quite nice also having a lot of online events like this where you can just be wherever you are and still uh, join in yeah, hope that answers your question. All right, thank you. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. There was one that came in to the chat for Gabriele um, from Isabella, which is a question about the monetization of labels. Um, extended descriptions are often offered in the form of audio or guide or a guidebook. Is there any ethic code regarding that? Thank you for um, this question. Of course, in theory, this kind of um, information should be provided for free. But in practice, uh, seeing that many museums are facing shortage of funds, they could be a possibility for the museum to uh, make some money out of it. So in the case of the museum in which I'm working in, uh, there is no audio guide and no guidebook yet. So we don't. Uh, anything to offer to to visitor now, but we will probably develop a free uh, guidebook that will implement this work that I'm doing. Okay, thank you. And another thanks to all of our speakers um, tonight and for all the participants for joining us. Um, this will conclude the ESAC talks portion of our of our discussion, and we will. Oops. Sorry about that. And we will break off into the breakout rooms for those of you that want to continue the discussion tonight. Um, and all you have to do is stay on the call. And so we thank you again um, for participating. And for those of you that need to leave, this is the time to, to log off. And we hope to see you again at the February event.